All right, uh, call the meeting to order. All members are present. This meeting is being audio and video recorded. There's no one here, so there's no public comment. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of May 6th? So moved. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? And now we'll move to uh, number six on the agenda, which is amendment of Chapter 360, Section 2.1, which is entitled Affordable Units. Motion to recognize Wayne Fine. So moved. Second. All of those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. So um, the definition of affordable units doesn't actually come up that often. So most affordable housing in town comes up with its own funding and they meet whatever the requirements for affordable housing from the funding sources. We have a few incentives in zoning and subdivision regs to encourage affordable housing, and that's where the second should come up. So if you know if we say in subdivision regs, for example, you can, you know, if you do X, if you provide affordable housing, then planning board can waive some things. Then the affordable housing definition would, would govern. When we first created the definition, everybody wanted affordable units to, to be affordable for as long as possible, and so there was a requirement for units being affordable for 99 years. That works for rental units, where you create a, an affordable rental housing, and you know, the intention is it remains in rental forever. It doesn't work particularly well for home ownership units, because for home ownership, the, the normal rule is 30 years, because people get a house, someone who's low income gets a house, they want to have the opportunity to have their assets appreciate just like we all do when we own homes. So one of the most important changes here is saying to be affordable housing, um, if it's a, a home ownership unit, it only has to be affordable for 30 years. If it's a rental to remain 99 years. It's 99 years, I mean, that, that's just such a long period of time. Why, why would it be that long? I, I, I hear you, you just said it's just yeah. so it can be affordable for a very long time. It's, but, I mean, why not renew it every, you know, 20 years or something like that? Um, it's just, it's just it'd, it'd, be pretty, it'd be impossible for us to really know what the housing situation will be like, you know, 99 years from now. But that's what the state does. You know, the, the typical term, if you're getting either federal tax credit, affordable housing tax credit, or getting money from the state, typically it comes with a 30 year requirement. So most new housing projects get a 30-year affordability requirement. Um, but again, from a developer standpoint, the costs for doing 30 years versus 99 years are not that different because they're basically saying we're not going to we're not going to be selling this; it's going to stay in our affordability stock. So just an example: Hampton Court, the big brick building on the corner of Hampton Avenue and, and Pleasant Street. Um, the city lent the money about 30 years ago. Uh, a few million dollars, so it was from a federal grant. So money, it wasn't city money, but we got a federal grant, we put it into the project. And because of a variety of things, um, they never were able to pay back the money um, because they originally were going to have funding from the state, from something called SHARP program, that ceased to exist. So they were sort of in, technically in default of this program because they weren't getting state money. We just negotiated with them a renewal of the affordability so we now have permanent affordability of the site. So they were willing to do that. They started saying, well, how about 30 years, because the state does. And we said, well, can we do it longer? And they basically said they didn't really care. Their pro forma didn't assume any money at the end of the day by selling the property. So for them, 30 years, permanent affordability wasn't a big deal. The, the state standard for 30 years is for home ownership units. Absolutely. Is it for both? It's both, yeah. Both. So most tax credit projects. So New South Street, the, the wood frame building right over here on the side, that was just renewed recently, and that was for a new 30-year affordability period. We put block grant money into it, and so we got some additional affordability. I forgot what that term was for. But typically, the state's doing 30 years. So it's not unreasonable. Those of us who have been around long enough, unfortunately, have seen projects that we were helped create that are now expiring. And so 30 years sort of is frustrating for some of us living through that. Um, and so I guess the main reason is we're not getting pushback from developers. It, you know, it'd be one thing if a developer said, I can't do the project otherwise, but we just, we haven't heard that. We do hear that for first time homeowner program. So then let me do the other part of this, and, and, and Joe has comes again. So the other part of this is, the city certainly wants to create affordable housing, I think with all city council support, 
and most we do it because it's the right thing because we need to house you know, residents because it helps us economically and you know lots of good benefits. But certainly one of our motives is the state has a goal of 10% affordable housing. This is in, in National Law 40 b And if you don't meet that goal, a developer coming to a project has a much easier time to waive local regulation. So it's good for us to show that we're above 10%. We're at about 11.4%. We're up and down you know, when new units are created to go up, when we haven't create new units, but it's market rate. What was that? I'm sorry, what was that number? 10% if they go 11.4 is where they are right now. We've been as high as 12.4, we've been as low as 11.1. But that's sort of the range, you know, you can guess as the years here. But we're usually above 10. We, we've always oh, been above 10. All the time I think we've been, been above 10. We worry about some, you know, we have some projects that are in the process of expiring. Pathway Farms is the biggest one where we're going to lose the units. But, you know, if, it, if the two projects on Pleasant Street go forward, and the um, project Christopher Heights and State Hospital go forward, we're probably up to 13%. But you know, it sort of it depends where you're at. When's Hathaway Farm, Hathaway Farms expire? Well, Hathaway Farms did expire. It, it, it had a mortgage which expired about 10 years ago. And the city helped sort of bring them along by putting some money into a fund that was subsidizing the rents that are there. And that money has been, ex been expended. So, Basically what's happening is there's no guarantee for affordability. A lot of people there have vouchers. So as long as they have vouchers, they could be living they, it, they say that there's no there's no project based subsidy that stays in the property. So vouchers you take with you get project based vouchers that go with the property, or person based vouchers, person based vouchers that go with the person and take with them. Um, so the second part of this is saying in our definition of affordable housing, we never said it had to count as affordable for mass general law forty B. So we're trying to change that and say, if you're creating these units that are affordable, you have to make them affordable so we get credit for them. So they count towards our 10%. So I guess to give you a couple of examples. Most projects in town that are affordable count towards our credit. Because anytime you're getting state money or federal money, they automatically count. And every time we've done a habit of humanity project, we've made we've required that count. So most projects. But there are a few that don't. 36 Bedford, which is a project that we did with Smith College. Um, that O'Connell developed, those units do not count for these. So they're, they're affordable, there's a certain percentage that have to be below 80% of area median income, which is at the threshold. Some have to be below 60%, but they didn't do an affirmative marketing and lottery. So the idea of the state is they're, they're worried, this isn't, I'm not worried this from a danger, but in some communities, there's discrimination going on. And so, to count for the units, you have to do a, you have to do affirmative marketing, and you need to choose who gets the unit by a lot. So that way, you're not choosing it because you like the color of someone's skin. Can this, can this only be done at the time? Is it too late now? You can't do it later. If Smith, if they were to, or we ask. If they wanted to, they don't want to. It is, it's a burden. It's a pain. Yeah, it's that. a lot of bureaucratic stuff they have to do. Yeah. And so part of why we're linking these two things together is. We're asking a little bit more, we're asking to go through extra paperwork so we get credit for the units, and that's tied with shortening the term for those first time home buyers. So that would be going forward if, if this ordinance were to pass, Smith could not do the same thing again. They would have to abide by, we'd have to be able to count those. So if Smith was coming to us with the same proposal today, they if, would be bound by doing. If Smith was taking advantage of one of the incentives in the zoning or in the subdivision rates, yes. Were they, they when not, they did, were they when they did that? Program? They were not. They were taking advantage of money that came from a development agreement that the city signed with Smith College. So there was some way in which there could have been leverage. Are there, are there other examples of people doing this besides Smith? I mean, is this a pretty, very, very rare thing? Um, it's rare because most people are also getting federal, federal or state, state funds. Money. It's an issue with the smaller units. So Habitat's been willing to work with us, but in most communities, Habitat units, or our units of all counted for Habitat. In most other communities, the same habitat, habitat in Pine Valley, don't count for 40 B credit. So we'd ask them to be, because every habitat project in the mm -hmm. the city's been a partner, and so that's been our ask for doing it. Do you see any downside to this? Is there ever going to be a developer or someone like Smith who says, okay, we're going to go ahead and do that? I know we had other leverage yeah, with yeah. Smith, but Mike Smith had said, you know what, this is so onerous to us, we're going to scrap the whole idea of affordability here. Well, the place where this came up, where this came to our attention, was um, Emerson Way, the old Hidden Oaks Estate off of Burstville Road. Um, and that project, we have a dead-end street requirement. We don't allow dead ends more than 500 feet long. 
unless you get a waiver from the planning board. The planning board won't give a waiver unless you're giving us affordable units. So that project had to create six and 40 units, but don't quote me the number, I can't get to it. So it was 11% of whatever they're building there. Um, and so they came forward and said, what do we need to do? And we said, well, you're not required to do 40B. We'd love it if you would do 40B. They looked into it and said, it's too much work. We don't want to bother doing it. So clearly, given a choice, people choose not to do it. Would it have scared them away? I don't think so. Because certainly, you know, if you go into your eyes open, Wait, wait, back up a second, so I'm a little confused. They said, when you said, we'd like you to do 40B, and they said, no, thank you, it's too. Right. Didn't they back away then? Or they did, but if we had said, as a condition of the permit, if you're going to build this project, you have to make it in 40B, they would have lived that condition. They, they in essence, needed that condition, because the product wouldn't So in work. other words, this would have, in their case, would have definitely affected them, and they would have said, okay, we'll go ahead, and we'll put up with all the work it requires. Yes, okay, exactly. Right. And again, if, if the deal sweetener was, because those are going to be first-time home buyers, if the deal sweetener would have been make a 40B, but they only have to be good for 30 years, that certainly would have made a difference. One of the reasons the talk, so the thing that brought it to our attention was the Emerson Way project. But one of the reasons the timing is so important is separate and separate track, this isn't before you tonight, is the zoning changes in URB and URC. And one of the things the zoning changes in URB and URC say is, you have some options for making units that are more, that are less expensive. One option is smaller units, and one option is affordable units. And so we'd like to know what does that mean if those, those units come in as affordable. So I'd just like to give my, my opinion if I can. Um, I, I think both these provisions are actually strengthening affordable housing, uh, affordable housing definition. I think it's good for that, for us to get credit under 40B. And I think reducing the home ownership or establishing a home ownership unit at 30 years is actually good for individual upward mobility. You know, if you're going to live in a place for 30 years and create equity, even if you bought it at an affordable rate, you should be able to sell it. I think that's actually that's actually good in terms of the general mission of affordable housing. But my concern, and I talked to you briefly about it, is it's just about process and um, two issues. One is you just mentioned it, the, the zoning regulations for seven or more units are still in process. And in fact, that affordable housing standard might, in fact, change um, before the moratorium is over. Um, and the second is, I would really like to see uh, the housing partnership take a stance on it one way or the other. I don't think I'll be surprised by their stance, um, but I always think it might be good for this committee to, to see what they say first, because, you know, um, as knowledgeable as you are, and you know, and we're thinking about this carefully, they may have ideas about this that we're not thinking of. So that was going to be my suggestion for today. Is it just a quick question? Is it going to be, is this being referred to the housing partnership as an element? Well, I don't know that it was referred, but I know that they're going to take it up on okay. next Monday. Okay. And I also know that, I mean, is there, there's not much urgency, especially no. because, as you say, it's tied to the zoning regulation. Well, it's separate from the There are other things potentially that would, I mean, it's we have no subdivisions before us pending right now, so it's just not timely. There could be another project other than URB and URC mm -hmm. where this would be relevant. But again, no one's mm -hmm. applied to us, so I think it's fine. I concur that. I think that's, I'd like to you know, see what they said. I'm not sure whether it then comes back to us or we just move it forward without a recommendation or we want to hear it again, but I'd, I'd like to hear what they have to say. Or we can do a few things. We can postpone, we can we can continue this discussion for a month because we'll have to, it doesn't have to come back to council for 90 days. We can send it forward without a recommendation to explain why that we are waiting to see what they're, what they're what, if, we, if we don't want to keep it here for a month. Um, I mean, I guess those are the two things that come to continue. Are we going to give it here? Do you have a recommendation you want? Otherwise, it's going to be And, you know, if this is the only agenda item that we're just waiting to see what they said, I mean, my preference would be. I, I prefer, I, I think we could send it forward because if we have, if we hear from, without a recommendation, if, if we hear from housing partnership, we always have the council floor where we can take it up again and just discuss it. I think it would, it's going to be something that we're going to want to discuss in council. Do you, do you say there is no rush though? There's no particular rush other than, I'm not sure, I don't think we're close to public hearing yet, right? The only rush is from no, no, when no, they close no. the public hearing is a 90 day clock ticket. And I don't think they, I'm not sure about that. Do you, do you know? 
Yeah. But the ordinance is not on the zoning regulations? Yeah. The planning has, but the zoning uh, ordinance has. For, but for, for the affordable housing for 2.1 specifically? I don't, I don't, well, I'd have to check. I don't think we have. Okay. That, that's, that's the only way we haven't acted on it. I have no preference. I mean, I, if, if we postpone it, we'll probably be doing it until, when was this preferred ordinance uh, from the council? Last year. Yeah, last Which was, year. I mean, if we postpone it until September, we'd still probably be in 90 days. Yeah. <coughs> I, I would just say that we've already had substantial discussion about it. And if we <coughs> next time, I imagine it would be quick. But we'll say, oh, here's how the housing partnership came down on it. And then we could. Do you have the next meeting August 5th? That could be September. If there's nothing else on the agenda. Well, That's my before point. we decide, um, how to send this forward with postponing. What is the median household income for North Hampton? It's a good question. Um, it was 48 for a family of four a couple of years ago, and I haven't checked where it is. Would you be willing to get updated information yeah, on that? Yes, Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mr. Friday? Yeah. Thank you for coming over. It's a short notice. Okay, it. thank you. Um, so, What's the session discussion on whether we should keep it or not? Sound like we want to move it. I sound like move you, it, but I'm happy to bring it back to you. I keep it. If we keep it, then we can get you know more feedback, and it'll be a quick discussion whether it's August or September, and then we can move it out. Uh, just in terms of the process of letting housing partnership kind of make a recommendation first, um, that would be my preference. I don't think it burdens us logistically. Um, they are they are looking at it on next Monday. But so it wasn't, so but it wasn't so preferred there, right? Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, I'm not sure it makes sense to postpone it if we expect them to support it anyhow and just to keep it here for the purpose of process sake. I don't really know if there's any benefit to that. Would you expect them to? I don't. I, I wouldn't expect them to make any changes. I mean, any came from them originally, but I think they weren't thinking about first-time home buyer piece. Um, we did send it to, to their staffer in May, so they had it for a while, but it didn't come to committee yet. Mm -hmm. um, just, this is just the median income piece. That sounds very low to me because you were talking about forty-eight. Is that a family? Where did family for? Okay. So it, it would make sense that I just looked it up that the median income is uh, 28,261. That would probably be a single person. So family of 48,000. Does that sound about right? You're looking at 80% because area median income is the, is, so first you should know this number is sort of useless except for we all have to follow it because we're part of the Springfield metropolitan statistical area. So the number is given from here away to Springfield which of course, frankly, has a much lower median income than we do. So the, the actual number is going to be lower than you all think it should be. So I, the numbers I was going to give you is area median income and then 80% of area median income because being affordable is 80% or below. 26,000 sounds to me like it's closer to 80% or even 60% of AMI as opposed to 100%. Please. So they do a moderate income, which is 80%, low income, which is but, you know, again, Paul, if you're finding it there, I trust your numbers over my memory. Yeah, because the internet doesn't lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every, everything. Can I say one other comment, comment that, that I told Ryan? Whatever order you all want is absolutely fine with me. It would be good to know, because in the past, you didn't wait for other committees. It was an ordinance to wait for everyone to weigh in. Yeah. So we would often come to this committee first in the process to begin discussion. If you want to wait for other committees, I have no objection to that whatsoever, but I'd just like to know it because we sort of plan our own critical path forward. And so it's not a good I just have two comments. Um, you know, I think in the case of this, this is a very specific ordinance. It's about the definition of affordable housing, and that's sort of my interest in having the housing partnership weigh in first. Um, even if we had an established process for which committees act first, I, I, I might be interested in having that go first. The other is I just I just wrote out the, the schedule. If, if, if we didn't act today, if I can just I'll, I'll tell you what the, the dates are. The housing partnership meets on the seventh. Um, we would meet again here on the fifth. It says to go to ordinance anyway, and they would meet on the eleventh. That's assuming we meet in August, and so this could go to the council as, as early as August fourteenth. 
I mean, so I just view it as not not much of a delay, even if we don't act today. Well, when is the ordinance meeting next? Ordinance meets on the 14th of July. Oh, excuse me. No, that's when the council meets. 11th, you said. Oh, it meets on the 11th of August. And so... Council meets on the 14th. It doesn't meet. Ordinance doesn't meet this month. No, it, 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 it will meet this month. It meets on the 14th of July. Oh, it does. Oh, I'm sorry, the council meets on the 10th and the ordinance meets on the 14th. In August, we meet on the 14th. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if ordinance will visit this after housing partnership, what's the point of keeping it in this particular committee? Here's my only concern with if, if it was a regular year. I know I was going to talk later if we, I, I can't make it on the 5th. I won't be here on the 5th. And I'm not sure if there's a date later in August. So one, would we have quorum that week, I think we should discuss. And number two is it going to be the only, if it were to be the only item on the agenda, again, I won't be here at the meeting, but I would, is it, is it really necessary, as Jesse's saying, or can the discussion be on the council floor? So if this was in the, not in the summer, I think it would be fine. But then, then let's look at the timing. Let's suppose saying either we don't have a quorum or you guys are just coming here to do that. But what if we don't have a quorum that it can't go to ordinance then? Then it has to be in our September meeting. And now it's starting to move towards the end of September, which, as you say, may be absolutely fine. There's no rush on this, right? So that's certainly do that. Yeah, so, you know, if there's nothing, if there's nothing else on the agenda in August, we, you could post a wish to add to a September agenda, whatever your preference is. Anyway. <coughs> well, the, was there a motion? Some? I, I move to continue. Uh, well, was there a second to that motion? All right, motion fails for lack of a second. Um, I guess so I, I move the question without recommendation. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Hey, thank you. Good night. It's fine. Is there any questions? Yes. Only because I'm, I'm sorry, the Dr. Casper just spoke to me again. Questions, it's just quickly on processes. When are we going to kind of Revisit again, then the whole issue. Of, you know, okay. I actually asked the mayor about that recently, okay. and he said he thinks um, at the end of summer, like in September, when you know when people when things pick up a little bit again, and, and and I said to him, well, you know, we're waiting about two issues, right, the, the toxicity and the parking issue, and I said when are we going to take it back up? So I think we can expect to take okay. it up in September. Again. Okay, but um, I'll 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 ask him again to make sure we keep on track and keep the discussion going. So let me just throw in a little bit. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not really clear on what the subject is. Sorry, Roundhouse brown house house property. Is it ad okay, brown house. Okay, gotcha. Oh. So just so you know, also just it became a, a, a kind of a, not a reality, but a reality to at least pursue, and I'm involved in it, is looking at the possibility of a movie theater and understanding that we would have to do, and this, the reason I'm bringing this up is it may affect that property. And it's just just a few hours ago I found out that how to go about doing that. There are a few people interested. We need to raise about $50,000 to do a comprehensive. There, there are ways they do these comprehensive studies. Amherst had it done when they built their theater, and they're actually I spoke to the chair there today again. And they even have a lot of help of what they believe they did wrong that could even make it more successful. So there's been a, a little bit of a movement uh, to have a movie theater somewhere in Northampton. And so I'm just bringing that up because I didn't put it on the agenda because, again, it, it was totally like, ah, great idea. It wasn't until yesterday morning that it actually started to say, okay, maybe maybe this could actually be something. So you're the first to hear about it outside of the first festival. Maybe looking at that space or? Uh, they being, I guess, I'm, 
chairing this ad hoc citizens group that we were looking at any space, but a few folks have mentioned that space. And when I spoke to the folks in Amherst who also put me in touch with one of the people who does this kind of intense analysis, um, who knows something about this area, and they, it, I never even knew any of this, that we actually are better off than Amherst because all these movies are done in zones, and Amherst is in the same zone as the multiplex, and therefore they have to pay a lot more for their movies, where we are actually in a different zone. So, and the reason, I don't know if you guys knew this, I didn't know it, the reason Pleasant Street actually had to close was American Dis for Disabilities Act, because the cost, I don't blame the act, that came up wrong, that damn act, like Paul and I, put that down, that damn American Disabilities Act, that the cost of renovating the theaters as soon as we touch them would have to have add things that for that space were impossible. And you couldn't continue to have that space and show the new digital films, which are all on computers, without doing the renovation. So it wasn't just the seating, which is I, what I thought is. The whole technology was, was making it anachronistic and... Right, so any change that they made, because they had to go digital, and any change any, they made... Any then substantive then change. They would have to, yeah. And, and the cost was just prohibitive. That space wasn't working. So there are a number of spaces that are possible, but one would be, as this person said, which I never really said, you know, in some ways renovating is often more expensive, which I know that, but it, and doing, especially for a movie house, you might be better off, is there any space where a new movie theater would go? And I'm like, well, there's this one place, and we're looking at, so again, it's, Still out there is a dream, but a more of a reality because what we found out is to do anything, you get one of these intense studies done, and they're expensive. They're fifty thousand dollars. And that would be in the parking lot, or where? I'm just asking because you know there's a whole new plan for Pulaski Park. That's right. Involves building sort of down. That's right. It, so it, it, what my my hunch, which is our guess, psychic read is. If the, you know, there's been some talk that the building that we're talking about going there, that's the possibility of going there, after the hotel and then other people saying, let's do a really you know, boutique hotel and that, not, and having been on this committee for a long time and looking when the first proposal was like, it must have been nine years ago, the, as we looked at it, everyone's, no one's going to build there, it's too expensive. There's still that possibility that anything that's, like apartments or hotel may not be feasible, even if it comes out of a committee, out, out of these meetings and says, I have a great idea. We may not have a bidder on there. If we do, that would certainly trouble a much smaller thing. Or maybe the building would go in and have a couple of movie theaters on the first floor. So my assumption would be that what we'd be talking about is something in that same footprint where any other building was, was going to go in, a hotel or the current. And the only reason it's more of a reality is there actually may be a couple of people who would fund this study, which then they say, no way you're going to get a movie theater, but at least the study gets So I'll be talking to the planning office in a, in a week or so, just talking to them about other possibilities. Does the Academy of Music have a digital project? It does. The Academy of Music would only work, and they actually did. That was something we looked at a few years ago in this committee and had a report. We didn't look at it. We had some people report to us. That unless the Academy of Music, so we were at that phase room where the Academy was kind of taking a dive, it's now doing pretty well. The only way to, to do movies there, and any kind of, except very sporadically, would be to do, divide it up. And nobody wanted to divide the academy because of the nature of the building, the historic nature. We actually couldn't do that and continue to get certain historic credits for that building. And so people were just saying, that's a great space. It's turned out that it's worked pretty well. Back a number of years ago, there was a question, is anybody really going to come in here and do shows and do this? And the answer is, yeah. They would. But the, the movie theater would need to. The only way movie theaters work right now is to, as you know, to divide them up. Amherst's mistake was they made one theater that only has 180 seats, and then two very small theaters of like 70 and 50, and now they have one that's like three, 
if you, if any of you guys haven't been to that one, that's actually outside the building, next to the yogurt place. It's like the old Pleasant Street Theater, but a step down. It's like smaller. It's just a few chairs with a screen. That's a fourth theater. And what I found out recently is that you want to have, they should have had a 240 seat theater and two other theaters that were about 150. And that would have really been much more. And they didn't listen to the folks who did the study, mm -hmm. who basically said, if you go that way, you'll make money on this. Mm -hmm. So, sorry it's coming. Right no. I thought I'd put it on the agenda Thank quite you. in September, but since it came in. Yeah, I uh, appreciate that. Is there any other business? Motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.